Um, so next up we have Adam Cuppy. So Adam Cuppy is from San Diego where he uh, works at Zeal as the Chief Operating Officer and at times has a really ridiculous moustache but he's uh, just toned it down for the Australian audiences today. Um, so Adam is also a semi-professional actor and he's done everything from improv to full-on stage shows and in between his COO duties he still manages to fit in like a full-on stage show every year. Um, so his talk today draws on his experience in theatre and it's about um, how consistent processes build confidence. So this is Adam's time, second time at Rubicon for AU. So welcome back, Adam. Yes. Well, hello to all of you. Uh, I assume if your experience was anything like mine so far, it's been very enlightening full of simple concepts wrapped in a lot of complexity, wrapped in simple concepts. <laughs> and I imagine that you've captured all of it and you have tons of knowledge to go forth with, right? I'm assuming so, right? Yeah. Of course you have, cool. Well, like was mentioned earlier, and as you probably saw on the schedule, this talk is about confidence, and more specifically, mechanical confidence. You might be asking yourself, well, what the hell does that actually mean? And that's a reasonable question. It's a totally reasonable question. Before we get too far though, and uh, I don't know if it's easy to bring house lights up just a little bit here so everyone can sort of see one another a little bit, but uh, if you could, uh, if you could raise your hand if you've ever uh, felt like you lacked confidence. Just raise your hand if you felt like you lacked confidence. Is it possible to bring the house lights up just a hair? Is that possible? Uh, no. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, all right, great. Now, now keep your hand up if, if, if you asked or told somebody that you had lacked confidence, that their response to you was something to the effect of, no, you just need to believe in yourself more. <laughs> now, keep your hand up if you felt that that was a total load of horseshit. <laughs> totally. If you're anything like me, this is not something new. In fact, you get asked this, told this a lot. Now, like was introduced a little earlier, uh, I come from an acting background. And the two most common questions I get is one of two things. Number one, how do you memorize all those lines? And number two is, do you ever get stage fright? And the response to both of them is effectively the same. The first is, well, that's why you rehearse, and there's an actual process to go about doing that. And the second is, every single time, but it doesn't matter. I've done this for 20 years. I've done this longer than I have. I'm only in my mid-30s, so I've been doing this since I was a teenager professionally. And I've done this longer than I've written software of any kind, especially not owned a company or whatnot. And so I feel like I have a, a degree of certainty around how this works. And what I discovered time and time again was that the most successful, consistently confident individuals on the planet were those that had developed routines, patterns, and practices that ingrained that confidence into their body. It wasn't just that they believed in themselves. Now, coincidentally, coincidentally that is what ended up happening. They did learn to believe in themselves, like myself. I, I believe in myself confidently as an actor, but that developed with, that was more a trailing indicator than it was a leading one. So it's not time, it's not belief. Now, my hypothesis again is this, that confidence is not the result of belief in time, it's in fact the result of ingrained successful patterns and habits. Now, uh, I, unfortunately there's no lights. <laughs> but regardless, um, stand up if you would, if you've written code for more than a week. <laughs> hey, you've written code for more than a week. Okay, great. Now, I want you to stay standing if you've written more than a month, for more than a month. Okay, look around. I mean, you're, you, all of us have pretty much done that, okay? Now, stay standing if you've written code for more than a year. Oh, wow, okay, fantastic. Two years, how about? All right, five years? More than five years. All right, now we're doubling. I mean, we're, we've got an algorithm we've got going clearly, right, Ellie? All right, now we're doubling. We're going to 10 years. You've written code for 10 years or more. 10 years or more. Okay, let's keep going. I don't know which algorithm we're talking about now, but let's double it again. Let's talk 20 years or more. 20 years or more. Wow. What algorithm determines the percentage of liars, though? <laughs> we don't know that one. Oh, that's fine. Okay, 20 years or more. Okay, so stay standing if you would. Now here's the funny and interesting thing is, this conference, two days worth, we've been learning about all sorts of things. We've been learn learning about algorithms and taming monoliths and adding numbers, <laughs> right? <laughs> 
So of you who are still standing at 20 years or more, I want you to raise your hand if you feel a degree of confidence now writing software as a developer. If you feel confident, it's okay, you can do that. <laughs> right? Okay. So you're raising your hand and you've done it for 20 years and you've been here for two days. Now, I want you to raise your other hand if you feel like you've been learning something over the last two days. Imposters! <laughs> All of you! You mean to tell me in 20 years, 20 years, it took, we had to learn how to add numbers and you're learning something? <laughs> 20 years? Oh, come on. Tom went over all this. 20 years. Let me give you a refresher. That's okay. So let's do this. We've got two plus two. If we turn two plus two into blocks, we make the left side green and the other side a rainbow. And then we stack that rainbow on top of itself. And then if we start to fill in that rainbow with all the things that matter, okay? And if you take those blocks and turn it into the Millennium Falcon, and then convert that Millennium Falcon into the empty spaces, you'll notice that there are 11 squares that are blue. Now let me ask you a question, 20-year confident folk. What is a number that won't divide 11 to create an even number? Four. Two plus two is four. You should know that, though. Sit down, you imposters. I'm never coming to this conference again. Says a confident man. I say it again, but confidence is not the result of belief in time. It is not. If it was true, there would be nothing left to learn for all of you who have been doing this for a period of time, but clearly that isn't true, right? It is not the case. So, I don't know if, uh, now, don't worry, I'm not gonna shame any of you anymore. <laughs> but go ahead and raise your hand again if you ever learned how to drive a car. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anywho. For those of you who learned how to drive the car the wrong way, I would imagine that when you started driving for the very first time, everything was new. You had next to no confidence. In fact, you were pretty certain that the only thing that was moving you forward other than your foot on the gas pedal or somebody sitting next to you forcing you to drive forward, right, was just this feeling that it was like, we won't die today. Many of you probably still felt that way, right? But here's what happens is I would imagine if you've been driving for years, at least, probably even as little as a month or less, right, that pretty quickly you started to gain this sense of understanding about how this process worked. And I would imagine today you could probably go the distance of eating something on your phone, driving with your left knee, right, looking in the rear view mirror, if not, you know, have kids in the background yelling at them, telling them to shut up while, you know, you should be paying attention to the road, all the whole time thinking to yourself, I'm fine, <laughs> right? Now, there's a reason for this, and it's that what happens and develops over time is these habits, routines, and practices. That's what happens, right? Because the experience stays relatively the same, especially if you're using effectively the same type of car, right? Because you do that, what happens is you gain a degree of confidence. Now, it might not be conscious to you all the time. Now, you're thinking about it now, but I would imagine you don't actually think about how confident you are as a driver. Because, again, it develops over time. Now, here's the interesting thing is if it, I'm assuming Australia is similar to America with the exception of one big difference, but in America, there's different classifications on your driver's license based on what? The different type of vehicle, right? And the reason is, is because the dynamics change. The, the situation becomes different, the mechanics are now different, and what happens? Disruption of pattern and process. And as a result of that, that becomes risk, and what do you have to do? You have to go back, you have to train, possibly take any classes, you, and then you have to recertify again. That's the process. Now, why is that? It's because disruption is an incredibly powerful thing. But here's what's interesting, and I will say as someone with experience having driven on the other side of the road, right, is that Immediately when you get into the car, if you've ever had this experience, the first reaction you probably have is, oh shit, right? But you've done it for years. Like, what's changed? Why is any of this different? 
And I would imagine that within a very short period of time, your mind goes through a checklist, conscious or subconscious, that says, okay, yes, it's different, but most importantly, what's the same? Can I normalize my experience? Can I take what I know and apply it to this and start to figure out what's similar and most importantly, what's different? More often than not, when we look at things like this, we're focusing on the thing that's different and losing, fact, uh, losing um, the fact that there are many, many things that are in fact entirely the same. But we're, because we're not conscious of those things. So if we start to apply some conscious awareness towards those things, they can actually begin to benefit us. Now, the beautiful thing is that our mind is built in a way that allows for all of this to be incredibly fast, but unfortunately, we're rarely conscious of it unless we put mental attention towards it. So that's what we're gonna do today. Before we get too far, let me tell you a story about a man named Eugene Pauly. Now, Eugene Pauly, um, around in the 60s, he started to baffle neuroscientists because at the time he was in San Diego and he was abroad, and when he was abroad, he contracted a bacteria that damaged a part of his brain that prevented him from ever retaining any short-term memory, right? So from the point, I think it was 1960, at the age of 59, about 59 and a half, until he died in his 70s, he had no idea time had passed. Everything was exactly the same. He would get into this habit, it was about a 90 second span. So he would get into this habit where he'd make a statement and he'd turn right back around and say the thing all over again because he never, he had no recollection that he'd done it the first time. Now, as time progresses, as with many of you, you probably move, and especially in his case, as he began to age, his wife specifically and his daughter and um, grandkids started to age as well, and they realized that he probably needed to be in a, in a place that was a little bit more controlled for him, and, and he understood a little bit better, so they moved. The problem, he couldn't remember any of these things. Now, here's what was fascinating, and the thing that baffled um, neuroscientists for a little bit, now again, we're talking the 60s here, is interestingly enough, while this, ended, while this man had moved to a place he had never been before after, his, after the contracted bacteria, he theoretically couldn't memorize anything. However, at the same time, he was able to start to move around his house and be effective. How in the heck would that happen? If he had no ability to retain short-term memory, he never thought he was older than about 59 years old, yet now he's in his 60s coming up onto his 70s in a house he had never been in prior to the accident. How could he possibly start to memorize, uh, remember these things? Now, when they sat down with him and asked him to draw a map of his kitchen, he couldn't do it, but he could, but he could consistently wake up in the morning, walk into the kitchen, get the eggs, toast, and make himself breakfast. But he couldn't tell you where the kitchen was, he couldn't write a diagram of where the eggs even were, none of the above. And what they discovered was this that the brain has two very distinct compartments. One of those compartments controls things such as short-term memory. It's like the RAM on a computer. There's another compartment that's more like a hard drive that retains long-term memory. Now, in the past, what was believed was that things would come into the short-term memory and then migrate their way over to long-term memory. What was fascinating was because he had no short-term memory, there was something that was still pushing the, that routine and that practice into his long-term memory regardless. Quite fascinating. So they started to run experiments on them and see what they could do. And, and in the discovery of this, what they found was that habit was the key to get him to learn new things. It was the thing that helped him reintroduce new things into his diet as he aged. It was the thing that helped them um, introduce walks um, in a manner in which he could take a walk by himself with ever, without having a guide because he could remember the route even though he was not conscious of it. And similarly, it was they were able to develop these triggers and these reward systems that could embed that stuff into the back of his mind so he could start to simulate the remembering and the emotional remembering of his own family and specifically his grandkids who he had not met prior. This is a very, very powerful thing. So, the question is, what does limited cognition do to us, right? How does limited cognition apply to the rest of our life? Limited cognition is effectively, in simple terms, it is the inability to remember it all, right? We just simply can't. When we go through a learning process, more often than not, what we're doing is we're dealing in this short-term memory, and our frustration is in our inability to retain it all. But that's okay, stick with it. Okay, I can leave now, because that's basically the message here, right? <laughs> but stick with it, and the reason is because even if you are not consciously aware of what you are doing, just simply by having a routine or practice that replicates that success model, even if you do that, eventually that will move into your brain in a manner that you're not totally cognizant of. And that is the goal. 
So let's go through real quick what those steps might be. They're quite simple. If you need to take notes, I recommend it, but you can also find these online, okay? So the first one is create a routine. It's really quite simple. Now, the most important thing is that you're creating a routine that is rather simple to follow, and more importantly, that routine creates the success that you want, right? Now, as an aside, one of the, the flaws or mistakes most people make is they try, and, they try and achieve too much with this routine. Make it simple. Imagine for a moment you're leaving, and uh, I know we're in Australia and sunscreen's quite a thing, right? And you keep forgetting to like apply sunscreen to your body and you're like, oh man, I, I can't do it. Yet at the same time, you always remember to grab your keys to your car. You always remember where those are at. You always remember where to get breakfast in the morning. You always remember where to drive to work, but that's the thing that you just can't seem to remember. Quick fix, put the sunscreen next to the, uh, next to the keys. Sounds kind of stupid and you're like, well, duh, but it actually works, right? When you bind together two routines, the, the, the simple association between the two, one successful thing and another successful thing will eventually help you remember. Now, the second one is find the trigger and the reward. Now, the trigger can be something as simple as, you know, uh, you're leaving for the day or, um, you know, as, again, as you're like grabbing keys or you're leaving or something along those lines. You can do the same thing in your work, right? One of the things that I discovered was early on this last year, our company had brought on a couple of interns. They had just come out of a code school. And I found it was kind of fascinating because they had been writing code for about three months. And they were doing a one month internship for us um, in Ruby on Rails. And after about the first week, they were encountering errors, as you do, and they were getting really tripped up. Now, I, this is a rough estimate, but I say well over half the time, they actually knew the answer. They knew what to do, but they lacked the confidence, right? Now, I was really trying to like figure this out. So I was like, you know, this is the thing that happens a lot. And I wonder if there's a way for us to expedite this. Is there a way for us to get over this hurdle more quickly? So um, I was looking and kind of observing their process, like how they did it. And I have to say, like, windows were everywhere. Terminals were hidden behind other things and, you know, the, the full screen sometimes and not other times and you name it. And I just found it interesting and we we're kind of working through it or whatnot. Then I went back to our team, many of which have been writing code for five to 10 plus years, and I was noticing that they were habitual about it. Raise your hand if you are habitual, verging on your definition of OCD about where your windows are on the screen. Okay, right? This isn't some flaw or anything along those lines. What you're doing, whether you're conscious of it or not, is you're controlling the amount of cognitive load you have to keep track of. You don't even realize you're doing it. So I ran an experiment. A Couple of weeks left in the internship, I said, here's the deal. Um, don't, please don't be offended, but here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to keep the uh, terminal on the left-hand side of the screen, I want you to keep the IDE on the right-hand side of the screen, and behind both of them, I want you to keep the, the browser window. Don't use new windows, only use tabs. That's all I want you to do. Don't change up colors, don't change up key bindings, keep it all the same way, but consistently do this, do this, and do this. Surprise, surprise, what happens? Almost immediately after only a couple of days, things started to just, the same questions they had started to just be resolved. Instead of going like throwing hands up and saying, I don't know what to do, right, they kind of could tap back into that sort of ability that they had had once before. So it kind of ran this, this theory that there was something in that. So something you can think about or try for yourself. Because again, I know many of you, a huge majority of you do exactly that. Now the reward portion of it is an actual legitimate reward. Reward yourself, right? Do something that you really, really love to do. Make sure it's something you're really, really enjoying. Now the third step is follow the plan. While confidence is something that is, can be automatic and ingrained, commitment is entirely a choice. If you don't commit to your plan and you don't commit to your routine, it'll do you no good whatsoever. In fact, it will do worse than that because you are triggered at psychologically to create routine for yourself anyway. This is the reason why we come to believe that time and experience are correlated. But they aren't, right? They're just, they just happen to follow a similar track. The fourth step is celebrate. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Put things down, and when I say celebrate, I want you to jump to your feet, and I want you to yell as loud as you can, and I want you to beat the person next to you. It's okay, we're gonna all look stupid together. Ready? One, two, three, yeah! Woo, okay, sit back down. Okay, I'm gonna do it again. 
but this time I'm gonna divide the room. This side of the room and that side of the room. We're going to compete to the death. No, I'm just kidding. Ready? This side of the room. One, two, three. Yeah! Okay, this side of the room. One, two, three. Yeah! How would you like to create an anchor right now that's positive and celebratory about this event right now? How would you like to do that right now? Yeah. Excellent, okay. Was this the best conference you've ever been to? Yeah! Come on! One more time, please. Is this the best conference you've ever been to? Yeah! Well played. Celebrate. If you're a team leader with your team, celebrate. Celebrate the failures. Celebrate the successes. Celebrate. Our minds love celebration. We bind that state of emotion to things, and we just love it. So celebrate. Trust me. It's going to pay off. And then the last thing is refine and iterate. So the real question in all of this is, well, how do we amplify the effect, right? Okay, so we're, we're doing this over time. That's great. Uh, you know, it's awesome. Yeah, pattern, practice. I'm going to put windows on the left. Got it. Cool. But I would really love to be like better, faster. Right, got it. So there's two factors. The number one, and I talked about it before, is link it to a successful routine. That's step one. Link it to another successful routine that you do. The other one is get perspective. Get perspective. And let me show you an example. These three symbols right here represent three individual numbers, one through nine. Can someone tell me what they are? Anybody? Four, seven, nine, eight, okay, okay, yeah. So, okay, so three different numbers, okay, all right. I understand you, we'll consider it a new language, we're learning something new, who knows, okay. So let me give you a, a key, we'll give you a Rosetta Stone, we'll call it, okay, ready? Here you go. So let's look back real quick, get these in your mind. Get them in your mind, look really hard, okay? Look really hard. Strip all that other, you know, limit your cognition to this. Look really hard, okay? There's your Rosetta Stone. Three numbers, there's your stone, okay? I believe in all of you. We're talking about three numbers, three, okay? Ready, are you ready? Let's celebrate. Are you ready? Yes! You ready? Are you ready? Yes? Okay, good. What is it? Oh, come on. Let me, okay, let's try this again. Okay, let's try this again. There's the numbers, right? Here's your Rosetta Stone. We're talking about nine symbols, people. These are just lines, right? Nine numbers, okay? Okay, get it all in your head. Ready? Get it all in your head, okay? All right, good. It's a little hard. What if I was to do this? It's called perspective. So now tell me, what number is that? Nice job. How about that one? Good job. It's really important to remember that one thing, even if you just get the data, if you just get the what, without the why, without the perspective, it's hard to amplify and apply the two together. So always remember that, especially if you're a team leader and especially if you're working with people that are experiencing something very new for the first time, I can't begin to tell you how important it is to provide context and perspective. Help them understand why something exists. Don't just tell them that it does. There's a lot of talks today where I think the core thesis is this, right? Is the reminder of how important purpose is. I mean, I made fun a little earlier of Tom's fanta truly fantastic talk. I truly, truly enjoyed it. And I was like blown away by this one component. Like I never thought about numbers like this. I never even thought about this idea. And so because of it, it really got, me, got my mind going. Just imagine what you could do with your teams and not to mention yourselves if you work to really understand the why. So I say it again, confidence is the result of successful routine. The more you can embed that, the more that you can create that for yourself. 
Now, I'm a little over time, but there's a couple of gotchas I really want to make sure that you know about. Okay, the first one is, I will say it again, these are, this is repetition, which is commitment is a choice, right? If you lead a team, even if it's of one other person, okay, it's super important that you help your team commit. It can be really easy in an agile, iterative fashion or an iterative environment to want to rapidly change a lot. That's great. Change to refine and iterate is fantastic. Keep doing it, but don't do it too fast. It's really important. The other thing to remember is that people go through a cycle of certainty and uncertainty. Again, like driving the car for the first time, there's a lot of uncertainty in the beginning where you're trying to figure out what's what and how to do, and then all of a sudden you figure it all out, and then that confidence is there, and you don't even realize it's happening anymore. I would imagine for all of you writing code, you're experiencing exactly that. And then somebody changes up the colors on the screen, and it's like you started from scratch and all you want to do is flip tables. I get it. I've been there. And as a team leader, it's really important to remember that that's the process people will go through. It's because uncertainty feels risky. It's totally okay. But what creates, what creates a negative impact is if you don't allow that team to get over that hurdle and really embed that process so that you can iterate later. Another thing that I do at my, uh, with my company is one-on-ones. And what I discovered really quickly is, you know, because I own the company, or I'm an owner in the company, um, there's that power dynamic that it's hard for me to avoid. It just exists. And so there's a lot of components to creating kind of this harmonious relationship where we can talk as openly as, and reasonably as possible. And what I discovered is the same rules here can apply there. And what I mean by that is, in the one-on-one -on -one structure, create as much commonality and certainty as you can, and one of those things is provide context, provide perspective. Don't just spring things on people, right? Don't just say, we're doing a one-on-one -on -one without saying, well, what are the goals of the one-on-one? -on -one? What is it that I hope to learn, right, as your manager? What is it that I want to hope to learn from you? What is it that you want to learn? Let's talk about that before we even start the one-on-one, -on -one, not in the one-on-one, -on -one, okay? And by simply doing that, it creates that perspective that allows us to really build off of it. And then, don't move the time right? If you do it at 3 o'clock on a Monday, don't do it next week at a 2 o'clock on a Friday. Stick with 3 o'clock on Monday. If you choose to change it, that's perfectly acceptable, but just don't do it too fast. All right. Now, please go here, mechanicallyconfident.com. There's a survey that I'd really love if you could take. It's important for me because I really want to know what do you do that creates confidence in your life because I'm building more on this, right? So there's going to be questions at the end about whether or not you want any additional resources. It's entirely up to you. The most important thing for me is the first half. I would really love to know what is it that you do in your life? What are the things that you now can become conscious of? It takes less than five minutes. So mechanicallyconfident.com. All right. That's it. Thank you so much for your time. Come see me afterward. Appreciate it. even I, I can't no that was amazing and somehow jumping up and down makes me feel more energized which is pretty important at the end of a just like information packed and enthusiasm excitement packed couple of days we are up to